open with prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm grateful, Lord God, to be in this place today, Lord. I'm very thankful, Lord God, for the moving of your Holy Spirit, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for each and every individual, Lord, that's come through the door today. Father, I ask you, Lord God, to have your way in the midst, in every aspect of the service today, in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, so for those of you who weren't here, we're in Proverbs chapter 4. So we know what wisdom is, right? Wisdom is our teeth? No? <laughs> wisdom is a, a person? <laughs> I know it. So um, last week, I read, I was reading from something I had printed out on the internet that pertains to Bathsheba, which it kind of got, I kind of got stirred up when I started reading verse 3 because of part of the verse said, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. And I kind of, you know, there's really not a whole lot about Bathsheba, about Solomon's mother. So the article is called Nine Men in the Life of Bathsheba, and I'm not going to review the whole thing. But Eliam, her father, Ahithophel, her grandfather, Machir, her brother, Uriah, her first husband, David, her second husband, and I left off at <clears throat> her first son. Before I do that, I'd like to read verse 3 from the, from the, get, from the beginning. For I was my, let me just start right from the beginning. From hear ye children the instruction of a father and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son. So I'm going to go to 1 Chronicles 28. I'm going to start in verse 4. How be it the Lord God of Israel chose me before all the house of of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he hath chosen Judah to be the ruler and of the house of Judah, the house of my father, and among the sons of my father he liked me to make me king over all Israel. And all of my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons. So we know that David didn't have he probably had more than two or three handfuls of sons because back in the day, being the king, you know. But over all my sons, he hath chosen Solomon and my son to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord of, over Israel. So it's not just, it's not Solomon's kingdom, it's not David's kingdom but it's the kingdom of the Lord. And he said unto me, Solomon, thy son, he shall build my house and my courts. Now listen to what the Lord said. For I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever, if he be constant to do my commandments and my judgments as at this day. So there is a stipulation there about having established the kingdom, his kingdom forever. And it is, if he be constant to do my commandments and my judgments. And so as we go through Proverbs, you're going to see how history plays this out in and where it, the kingdom ends up, and so on. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to go back to the, the rabbit trail because the rabbit was too fast to shoot, and I, so anyway, I'm going to have to stay on the rabbit trail and stay on the rabbit to the end of it. Okay, so 
we're getting down to where David had gotten Bathsheba pregnant. And she was going to give birth to her first son. But we see Nathan, the faithful prophet. He is neither biased for or against the one to whom he is sent, but concerned totally with conveying the message of Jehovah. I'm going to turn to Deuteronomy 1 and 17. Ye shall have no respect, ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great, and ye shall not be afraid of the face of man, for the judgment is God's, and the cause that is too hard for you, bring it unto me, and I will hear it. So, you would think that you know, a lesser man or prophet or somebody that was very fearful. Now, he had to deliver a word to King David, you know. And it wasn't a very easy one to deliver. But anyway, he did deliver the word. It was about the sin that he had committed. Um, so anyway, the child which David sired in sin was born with an incurable disease. Second Samuel two and fifteen. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's 12 and 15. <laughs> Gosh, no wonder I couldn't find it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. So the the child didn't get sick by himself, but the Lord struck the child. <clears throat> I read earlier about keeping the commands of the Lord, and so far throughout the book of Proverbs, with keeping the commandments of the Lord, there's promise of life. But on the opposite side of the coin, if you don't, then what's the opposite of life? There's death. So, unfortunately, the Lord had to deal with David in this respect. And you know, all the pleading and all the fasting and all the crying that David did, because the Lord God is no respecter of persons, it didn't matter whether he was the king or whether he was a peasant, It says that he had an incurable disease and he was, it translates into very sick. David fasted and prayed for the life of the child. And when he died at the age of seven days, David immediately laid aside the garments of repentance and mourning and broke his fast. See, God looked on David's heart and God always has a heart after God. And David was, David absolutely was very quick at repenting and, and having a change of heart and seeing, you know, where he had gone. I just want to um, just touch on no respecter of persons for a couple minutes here. Romans 
Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Deuteronomy 16, 19. <clears throat> thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons. Neither take a gift, for a gift does blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of, right of the righteous. See, you can't sit in a place of being a judge or a king or in a place of authority if you're biased. You can't take a bribe. Second Chronicles 19 and 7. Therefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. <clears throat> Proverbs twenty four twenty three. These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to have respect of persons in judgment. And it was Solomon's job to sit in the seat and be a good judge. <clears throat> Proverbs twenty eight twenty one. To have respect of persons is not good. For a piece of bread, that man will transgress. Go to Romans 9.13 if you want to. Remember I said that God's no respecter of persons. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now, what did uh, Esau do? God knew ahead of time what he was going to do. He sold his birthright for a bowl of soup, or in my translation, a piece of bread. Something for the soul. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, something for the soul. And you know, this, the whole, what I'm getting out of Proverbs 4 is... Spirit and soul, there's a lot to do through this whole proverb. There's a lot to do with the soul and the spirit. So, so David, okay, so the child died at the age of seven days. How come the child didn't die at the age of nine days or ten days? Does that spark? Okay, I know he's got the answer, and I've got it right here. <laughs> He's probably going to go where I've been. <laughs> oh, gosh. Don't, don't ask hard questions if you don't want hard answers. I want the answer. I've you got the answer here. had to die one day before circumcision. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. You couldn't create a covenant. Exactly. So, um, so I want to go to <clears throat> Genesis 17 and 12. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man-child in your generations. He that is born in a house or, brought, or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an, ast for an everlasting covenant. So God already had predestined for the child to die. 
So there's no way the child could live past seven days or he'd have to make a covenant. Luke 1, 59. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child and they called him Zacharias after the name of his father. And we pretty much know the story that he's actually named John. Luke 2, 21 through 23. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. That was just a little tidbit on, <clears throat> on why the child died at the age of seven days. So David immediately laid aside the garments of repentance and mourning and broke his fast. This change of manner is noted in 2 Samuel 2 and 20. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself See, David brought himself right down to the low of lows, and he was rolling around in the dust, per se. And he anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. So he, was, he already knew in his heart that it was done. That was it. God had dealt with him. It's noteworthy that not only did he change his own appearance, but he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Now, how many people... All right, let me not put it that way. What would, what would our fleshly reaction be if we knew that God had taken our child... Would we be able to go into the house of the Lord and worship? Sister Carol says you have to. Right, because that's, you have to praise the Lord God in all things, you know. And I believe that, you know, there's healing in that. And part of the healing of, of getting over the sin and what have you is in worship. So rather than accusing God of taking the life of his son, of his sin son, or being in bitterness that he was being punished, he accepted the discipline of the Lord. And there is no reason to think that Bathsheba felt any differently, except for Bathsheba had to go through the pains of childbirth and the nine months of carrying the child. <clears throat> That's right. Earlier on when I read this, I was reading about that David broke half of the Ten Commandments when he coveted his neighbor's wife. There was murder. There was adultery. There was just different things. And, you know, so God, in his greatness, he has to deal with our sin. So we get down to Solomon, Bathsheba's second son. Like Bathsheba herself, her second son was given two names. Pardon me. <clears throat> however, in his case, however, both were given at birth. One by David, 
Notice the masculine pronoun in 2 Samuel 12, 24, and the other by Nathan. Nathan named him Jedediah, meaning beloved of Jehovah. Those, eh, some commentators take it as pardoned by Jehovah. But 2 Samuel 12, 25, and David named him Solomon, verse 24, meaning peaceful. And so why was he able to build the house of the Lord and the temple of the Lord? Because he was a man of peace. He was peaceful. There wasn't the warring spirit like his father David. The two names taken together present a beautiful thought. I have peace because I am still beloved and have received pardon for my sins. That was a thought, a possible thought that David had for naming him Solomon. We know little about Bathsheba, the mother. She may, she may have delegated much of his education to Nathan the prophet. But here's the thing, you know, being the king and growing up in the king's house, you can rest assured, you can be guaranteed that the level of education was top notch. And you know, when it comes straight from the Lord, it don't get any more top notch than that. <clears throat> we do know of her desire for him to accede to the throne from the account in 1 Kings chapter 1. The last chapter of the book of Proverbs is attributed to a king named Lemuel. While some take him to be an unknown monarch of a nearby country, most commentators agree with the ancient Jewish rabbis in identifying the name Lemuel along with Agur of chapter 30 as pen names for Solomon. If so, the first verse of that chapter is worthy of note. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. This would describe the entire chapter as a prophecy of Bathsheba. An analysis of the chapter seems to confirm this view. As a mother, one desirous of his exaltation, she should know, she would know her son better than anyone else. In this prophecy, she zeroes in on Saul, one on Solomon's two greatest weaknesses, which throughout the ages have been the downfall of many, both kings and low men alike, and that is wine and women. Those are Solomon's two greatest weaknesses. In verses 4 through 7, she admonishes him that it is not for kings to drink wine. The, rem the remainder of the chapter gives a job description of the kind of wife she would desire for Solomon. The indication is of a mother's intense care for her child. Notice how, she, how it says the kind of wife she would desire for Solomon. <laughs> the indication is of a mother's intense care for her child and a keen eye for his weaknesses which need attention. Okay, so anybody that has a mother, <laughs> any, guy, any guy in here that has a mother, you know that she has always wanted the best for you. And especially if you grew up in the house of Zion or in church or what have you, in a Christian home, she wants the one that God has picked out for you because that's the best. Nathan, her, th her third son. So we're getting down to the, the ninth person, the ninth man in the life of Bathsheba. Nathan is the first child Bathsheba has the privilege of naming. The first child died before a name was given. The second was named successively by David and Nathan the prophet. 
successively because of what his name meant. You can see throughout his kingship that for the most part, he, li he lived up to the name that was given to him successively. The name she chooses gives an insight into her character. Very likely, it was chosen in honor of her friend and counselor, Nathan the prophet. Yet, this was the very man who pronounced the death sentence of God on her firstborn. So, <clears throat> so you see that she had respect for the word of the Lord. She had immense respect for God himself. How few would have the moral fortitude to not only accept such a harsh pronouncement of punishment, but honor the one delivering it by naming the first child they are privileged to name with his name. If we could each value our critics so dearly as to appreciate the words they speak, you know, um, sometimes somebody says something to us and we may not necessarily hear it the way that it was intended because we're not hearing it by the Spirit. And so we might walk away with a different attitude other than the one that God intended for us to have. Even when... Okay, so if we could each value our critics so dearly as to appreciate the words they speak, even when, perhaps, especially when, they are contrary to our actions and reproofs of them. <laughs> Who was saying? I think it was Pastor that was saying he's a great reactionary, or was. I mean, yeah, me too. Um, you know, the Bible says be... Right, swift to hear, slow to speak, be slow to anger. And sometimes, <laughs> more than I want to admit, I can be quick to react to a situation in a negative way instead of stepping back and, and looking <laughs> and, and seeing maybe a different picture than the one that I'm seeing. God's forgiveness of the sin of David and Bathsheba is further highlighted by the fact. Now, you've got to hear this because this really perked me up when I got to the bottom of this because what would have happened if God had judged David for the sin and had killed David instead of the child. Think about that. You know, aren't you glad that God is patient, forbearing? He, he's long-suffering, so, I mean, he can outweigh us. He gives you a space of repentance. He gives you that time to repent and to get right with him. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't smoke you immediately because he sees the bigger picture. He painted the bigger picture. So God's forgiveness of the sin of David and Bathsheba is further highlighted by the fact that both the mother and stepfather of Jesus come from their lineage. Joseph is a descendant of Solomon. Uh, Matthew, I'm just going to go to Matthew 1 and 6. And Jesse begat David, the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. And verse 16. 
And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So Joseph is a descendant of Solomon. And Nathan is the ancestor of Mary. Luke 3.31. Which was the son of Nelia, which was the son of Menon, which was the son of Matatha, which was the son of Nathan, which was the son of David which was the son of Jesse, and so on. <laughs> but can you see God's infinite wisdom in everything he does? He doesn't make mistakes. Because he's the Alpha and the Omega, he sees the end from the beginning. So he knew what the end result would be in the lineage of David, in the lineage of Jesse, so the summary is, thus, while we know little of Bathsheba directly, from the men surrounding her, we get the view of a faithful woman of Israel who is unfortunately known mostly by her one sinful act. Well, hopefully now that some of this, her life was brought to life through the men that she was associated with, it can give us a different viewpoint. We begin to view her as a woman of prominence, a faithful mother, a humble penitent, a wise prophetess, and a favored wife of the man after God's own heart. Okay, so that rabbit is now put to rest. So Proverbs 4, verse 4. Oh, there was another thing I wanted to put. Uh, For I was my father's son, this is verse 3, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. And what I had written down for, <clears throat> for sight was, okay, I had gone through tender, being um, sensitive, expressing re or responsive to love. Um, not to be confused with wuss or pushover. Now, being only, I thought this was pretty go a pretty good um, meaning for the word. It means alone in its class, nothing more than, or without respect to anyone or anything else. And that's where I got one of the tidbits for God's not respecter of persons. Um, but he was tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. Okay, so sight is something seen or worth seeing. Imagine that. So the more time we spend in his presence, the more intimately we know him, the more we shall be like him, and the more we are something worth seeing. Because when we look in the mirror, the more time we're spending with him, the more we see him. <clears throat> uh, four, four. Verse 4, he taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. Now, there's so many. The heart is the whole personality, the emotional and the moral part of it. Psalm 19, verse 8a, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. 
Psalm 119 and 10. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Let me not wander from thy commandments. Psalm 119, 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You know what it is to retain? He says, He taught me also and said, Let thine heart retain my words. To retain means to keep or hold on to. You know, <clears throat> inside a person's heart, there's many things, you know. And the things that we cherish the most, we tend to keep and hold on to in our heart. First Thessalonians 5, 21 through 22. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Hold on to. Retain. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Keep my commandments and live. There we go with the commandments. Because there's a promise. When we keep his commandments, we have life. Deuteronomy 11.1, 1, Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments always. Not just once in a while. And I know, you know, a lot of times we inadvertently don't necessarily... He's, he's written his commands on our hearts. So, I mean, could you imagine if we had to go back to the Old Testament way of doing things and <clears throat> all the book, every, every kind of commandment? I mean, you know, until it gets in here, you're almost set up for failure because there's just too much. Get wisdom, get understanding. Now, <clears throat> I looked up understanding in the Strongs, and it's actually what I got out of it. It says further on, forget it not talking about understanding. Now, understanding... Oh, no, I'm sorry. I didn't look up understanding. <laughs> I'm on the wrong word. Understanding is ability to comprehend with the mind. Remember your mind, your will, your emotions? That's what I got out of understanding. It has to do with your soul. <clears throat> and I looked up because it says, forget it not it being understanding. And I looked it up in the Strong's and it's um, number 846 in the Greek dictionary of the Strong's. And basically it means her, she, it, him, himself. It's not really, um, it's not really male nor female, but it's a mixture of both. But really it has to do with the soul. Now wisdom is a person, we know that. Masculine, the Holy Spirit. And understanding is the soul. And I lost where I was. how organized I am. <laughs> I try. I'm trying here. All right, so you ever have a thought and... All right, well, anyway, okay. So I see wisdom and understanding as a marriage, okay? With wisdom being the head... 
or the principal. Because if you go farther down in verse 7, it says, Wisdom is a principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. So let wisdom or the Holy Spirit take preeminence over understanding, over the soul. You know, let, let your soul be... It's not easy. I mean, to allow yourself to let the Holy Spirit work in you so that he overtakes the soul realm because, you know, the whole man needs to be saved. <laughs> Part of the renewing of the mind. It is. It's, it's putting on the mind of Christ. Uh, scripture says in First Corinthians, it's, it's just a repeat of what you said, Jesus Christ has made unto us wisdom. Mm -hmm. So wisdom, wisdom is just as easily pronounced a person. Uh, Christ is wisdom. Mm -hmm. But understanding is what we understand of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And our understanding is always in flux. Yeah. Yeah. What I knew yesterday may change tomorrow about wisdom. Wisdom is always brought to me. The Holy Ghost is constantly bringing wisdom to me, but my understanding is in flux. It's constantly being moved in, into another dimension. So it, that's basically what he's saying. With all, with all you're getting, get understanding. Move yourself forward. Allow your mind to be constantly be transformed. Correct. Right. Understanding is the ability to comprehend um, with the mind. And that's why, you know, when I think of the mind outside of the mind of Christ, you know, it's, it, it has to do with the, uh, the mind, the will, and the emotions. But I've, been, I've been thinking about that word understanding. And I think when we hear it or we say it, we... We know what it means, but we really haven't thought about it. Yeah, we don't know what it is. Understanding is two words. Mm -hmm. Under, standing. Did you ever hear the phrase, a standalone truth? Okay. So, so let's think that that microphone stand back there or your podium or whatever is the standing. It's the standalone truth. But under are the three legs that support it. So standing a truth is supported underneath by all the things that make up that truth. So there's more to understanding. Understanding is a very above and below concept. It's horizontal. And it's vertical, understanding. And I just, you know, <clears throat> it takes me a little while to get warmed up or jump-started or what have you. You know, when I sit down to read, as soon as I start reading, I'm not getting the gist of what, what the Holy Ghost is telling me. So it takes me a little while, you know, 45 minutes really isn't enough time to get rolling. To, to get rolling, <laughs> right. Um, because, you know, there's many different aspects of wisdom besides yeah. being a person. You know, I'm a person, Brother Ron, but I'm a father. Yeah. I'm a son. Yeah. I'm an uncle. Yeah. Yeah, right. I'm a cousin. Right. You know, so there's many legs to there's that so standing. many different aspects yeah. of, of the meaning of hmm. not just wisdom but understanding throughout throughout proverbs mm -hmm. 4 that there's not enough time to touch That's these it. today so see you next